Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining and welcome back to Wall Street Silver. Our guest today is my great friend, Adrian Day from Adrian Day Ma Asset Management. Welcome back, sir. Well, thank you, Ivan. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's always a pleasure having you come down to Wall Street Silver. First and foremost, I wanted to say what is happening in the world. You see the gold markets, the silver markets uh, going crazy. Uh, lots of central banks are buying gold at all-time records, all-time highs. Uh, what do you see happening with gold and silver from now to the end of 2024? Yeah, yeah. Well, just to set the scene, as as everybody knows, you know, we went from 2000 to 2400 in basically three months. That's an astonishing move for an asset like gold, yeah. especially when the dollar was staying strong. So right, it wasn't yeah. caused by the dollar collapsing. You know, for, for, for an insurance asset, a defensive asset, to move like that is really astonishing. We all know the reasons I won't go into it. So we pulled back from the 2,400 level. We're now just, you know, just above 2,300 as we talk. Um, but, you know, again, that's, that's not surprising given the move we've had. And I would characterize it um as gold is is really resisting dropping you know it's 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 dropped whether in asia or in europe or in the us it's dropped in one of those markets and then slowly recovered you know some ground so it's really right. resisting dropping and i think frankly that just speaks to I think that speaks to the demand that's out there for gold. So what 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 I see for the balance of the year, you know, as we've said at the moment, it's the vast majority of buying in the last three months, but also in the last 18 months, but particularly, let's say this year, has been central banks and Chinese savers. Right. We shouldn't ignore the Chinese savers because, you know, they're concerned about their economy, they're concerned about the Yuan devaluation, and they're concerned about uh, the fact that uh, China might be introducing easing measures. And they're looking for a, a, a way to protect their purchasing power. Yeah. And they're not going to put their money in the bank. They're worried about the banking sector. They're not going to put their money in real estate, which is where Chinese people traditionally have put their money. And they're not going to put them in stocks with the stocks as low as they are. Some of it's going into stocks. We've seen a rally in in, Hong, in Chinese stocks in the last couple of weeks. But most, you know, most of it is going into gold. They can't put it into Bitcoin, as you know, or cryptos, they're banned. Mm -hmm. So most of it is going into gold. And when you look at those two buyers, they are driving the market. They have been driving the market. They have a vast majority of the buying that we've seen this year uh, and uh, central banks for last year. Right. When we see, as we will, when we see a shift in sentiment among Western investors, that's institutions and retail, which we haven't seen yet. Remember, we talked about this last year, the outflows from ETFs. We are still seeing more outflows from gold ETFs than we're seeing inflows, which given what gold is doing is really quite astonishing. We're still seeing very low premiums on coins and low deliveries from mints. Mm -hmm. So the demand among retail, among institutions is just not there. When sentiment changes, then that is one whole new wave of buying that will come in. And, and I think the central bank buying is going to continue, not at the same rate it did last year. I don't think that at all. I think we'll see this year I think this year we'll see net buying, That's strong true. net buying, but considerably less than last year and the year before. But when we have a new wave of buying from Western investors, institutions and retail, then I think gold and silver both are going to move meaningfully uh, this year. So where will we end the year? I don't know. I mean, you know, <laughs> I don't know who it was. Was it Barnum or someone? <laughs> WC feels, I don't know, but someone said, if you're going to make a prediction, <laughs> don't predict price and time. Yeah, that's true. But um, yeah, well, I, think if... be, I think we're going to be higher than we are now at the right. end of the year. And a lot depends on the dollar. You know, the dollar is so strong because Western investors are going to be price sensitive in a way that the Chinese saver who simply wants to get his money, who wants to get his money somewhere safe and out of a banking system is is. I won't say absolutely price agnostic, 
but they're less price sensitive. And a central bank that's worried about the US steel in our assets, they are less price sensitive. But you, uh, Western investors are gonna be more price sensitive. Um, so a lot will depend on what happens to the dollar. Do you think the do you think the U.S. dollars like the strength of the U.S. dollar is all an illusion? Because uh, just from twenty twenty till till this till today, uh, the U.S. dollar, Adrian, has has depreciated by twenty five percent from twenty twenty just to twenty twenty, just four years. Right, but you look at the last. Let's just pull it up. Look at the last six months, right. and we are basically at a high. Uh, for the last six months. Um, I mean, it's come up in the last few days, but other than the last few days, you know, we're at a six month high basically in right. the dollar. Right. That's that's what I was meaning. I wasn't. Yeah, yeah that makes Yeah, all. that makes sense. But if gold keeps going up while the US dollar is strong, what happens to gold, you know, as the US dollar goes down? Yeah, it's just of course. Keep it, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's the thing about gold and silver right now is the strength is in the face of a macroeconomic environment that should be negative for gold. Right. You know, a strong dollar, uh, uh, aggressive rate hikes and rates too high, and the Fed pushing back on cutting rates this year. So all of those things in a, quote, normal environment, or if you are only looking at the macroeconomic environment, gold should be falling and significantly lower than it is right now do you so think buying pressure is it just the buying pressure that's uh just incredible right now from central banks and countries is that what's keeping it up i i i think it's the yes absolutely it's 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 uh it's the buying pressure central banks and 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 chinese savers and also it's clear to me that there are some big buyers in the market in europe as well as the u.s but primarily in europe as well as Middle East and Asia, some big buyers who are concerned about the fragility of the financial system, frankly. Right. I think we probably discussed that last week. But, and again, if you're concerned about the fragility of the system and you want to start getting some money out of financial assets and into something that will hold up in a financial crisis, again, you're less sensitive to price than a typical investor right. um yeah so it's that buying pressure that's that's pushing it up and what do you think uh, a lot of the ch chatter lately has been talking about you know delinquency rates and what's happening uh like right now office delinquency rates the floating rate uh, office cmbc the loans hit 20 percent. so uh you know they spiked to 20 percent recently and in 2012 and 2013, it says the delinquency rates of office uh, CNBCs eventually exceeded 10% is one of the many uh, consequences of the financial uh, crisis. So now we're seeing it at 20%, these delinquency rates. What, what does that tell you there? Yeah, no, I mean, it, well, it tells us what everybody knows, which is that commercial real estate is in a heap of trouble. Right. And it's it's obviously the, 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 the remote work hasn't helped, but that's only one part of the equation. You've also got the equation that so much, so much real estate was was purchased on excessive leverage by borrowing when rates were, you know, at zero or one percent. And obviously rates moving up has not helped at all. So everybody knows it's in trouble, um, except it seems the banks and the banking regulators, because they're still holding most of it um, at book. Right. So they haven't marked down at all, but by and large, by and large, I shouldn't say haven't marked down at all. But but I think a lot of a lot of the loans on banks and also the insurance companies um, are being held at artificially high, high levels. Do you uh, think, in a you know de defer and pretend absolutely do you scenario. think do you think that uh like do you know or do you like do you have any idea of when these uh, banks have to uh, make these losses realized because now it's unrealized losses but do you know any by any chance when like does it take a year or like how long do they get to just keep it on the books as unrealized losses um no that's a good question there's two two answers to that one answer is 
when the banking regulators come round and start looking at looking at the loans and telling them they have to mark them down, which is what we saw in 2008-9, right. I don't think they're going to do that right now because the banking regulators have to know that the banking system, I'm not talking about Chase, you know, but a lot of the banks, even some of the bigger banks, but a lot of the banks are are, are, are in a fairly precarious situation right now. Right. I don't think the banking regulators want to force those kind of cuts on them that will that will drive some banks to, you know, into the arms of the FDIC. Right. The other issue, of course, is if I'm if if I'm a lender, I mean, if I'm a borrower from your bank and I default. And at that point, you have no chance. You have no option but to but to uh, write make it, it make it realize. Like if you're a right. lender who gave the lender money, but it wouldn't right. that. But the bank wouldn't have to make the because if it's a central bank or if they're giving loans, would they have to? Are they the lenders? The bank? No, the banks are the lenders. Right. So I I would go to the bank and I'd say, listen, can we can we cut the interest rate? Can we term you know? make it a longer term on a deck can we renegotiate right and most banks are going to go along with that at this point because they don't they want to avoid writing the loans off so you're saying that so the lender the lender will lender. the lender will cut the rates if the client comes to them and says because they don't want it to be a bar or in, 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 yeah in certain circumstances i mean if you if you think the, the borrower is just plain bankrupt <laughs> there's no <laughs> extending extending it but so what ha what happens if like all these people start going bankrupt? Like others start you start seeing bankruptcy because they can't afford these high interest rates and they own all these properties and you start seeing a domino of all these not just banks but like regular people start you start going bankrupt one after another. Then they they just realize losses just like that. You, uh, you mean something broader than commercial real estate? All you over, mean? yeah, yeah, everyone, real estate investors. Well, yeah, I mean, obviously, if if I can't pay my um, mortgage or I can't pay, pay pay my car loan, um, you know, if it's if it's if it's collateralized against an asset, the bank takes the assets. Right. But banks, as you know, don't particularly want a portfolio of of broken real estate and old cars. You know, that's not yeah. the business that like let's is. say let's say I'm a private investor and I have a hundred let's say a billion dollars in commercial real estate but now you no longer can afford these loans and interest rates at these rates and you're starting to make crazy losses and then you go bankrupt on that but that does the bank and the lender and the, and the do they declare that as a realized loss now well they would have to they they would try to you know they would try to re they try to negotiate with all of the borrowers because right. there's typically more than one um all of the creditors whatever other creditors there are if it went to bankruptcy you know the whatever whatever assets that that land that borrower had would be spread among the creditors and the lenders and then the bank you know the banks would be left with the real estate and they would try to find a buyer at, at the best price they could get absolutely uh, well, which in this market is not good <laughs> yeah this yeah especially not in this market before you uh go adrian do you have any last words for wall street silver any good anything you good anything like on your mind what, what do you have to say yeah i mean one thing i do want to you know i've been saying for some time that i think the u.s is heading towards a recession i i, I don't think we can avoid it mm -hmm. um uh and 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 but but two things on that one is you know, the lower half of the income um, are, are in much more trouble than the upper half, and particularly Absolutely. the upper twenty percent. Um, so, so when people say to me, "Well, the economy is doing great," the economy is doing great. I say it might be doing great for you, but it's not doing great for fifty percent of the population. That's one thing. The other thing, though, is when you and we've said this before, but when you have ultra easy money for so long, and we had ultra easy money from two thousand and nine all the way through to 2022 and particularly after covid but you've got that easy money for so long and interest rates they were zero lower bound in the us for a long period of time where people could right. borrow money particularly their collateral at very low rates then it takes longer 
it takes longer for the impact of higher interest rates to, to show up in a recession. But everything is pointing in that direction. And if I may, just just in, in closing, I know you're in a hurry. Just in, no, I'm not in a hurry. We go, another 20, we go another half an hour. <laughs> Look, looking at a, a specific, look at the jobs report today, the payroll report today. On the surface, yes, the number of new jobs was lower than expected, but you might say, we're still we're still generating new jobs. Eh, wasn't so bad. But lift up the hood and incrementally, incrementally, everything is getting worse. The unemployment rate ticked up a tenth of a percent, admittedly. And I can't help thinking Jerome Powell, when he spoke on Wednesday, Jerome Powell, the Federal Reserve head, when he spoke on Wednesday, he must have known what the unemployment rate was going oh, to be 100%. because he said... You know, we're not going to be worried if it ticks up by a tenth of a percent. <laughs> well, <laughs> anyway, it ticked up by a tenth of a percent. Um, but then you look at other indicators, like the hours worked was down because of slack work, meaning companies have an employee, but they simply don't have enough work for them. So they work fewer hours. Um, the other thing to watch is, um uh the last two payroll reports they were revised downwards which is a a trick that the bureau of labor statistics does fairly regularly these days it seems so why why they, do they revise them downwards well how how do they revise them well because they say they have more information you know the initial oh. report is is based on whatever information they have and then they get more reports in and they analyze the data better and, and they can revise downwards or upwards. It's not unusual to revise the prior month up or down, but what we've seen for the last, uh, really for the last 12 months is we've seen two revisions, um, for, you know, the prior two months and last year, something like, so that's, that's 24 revisions, mm -hmm. something like 21 of those 24 revisions were downwards. That's not a surprise. It's it's I. That's not a coincidence. It's either an indication that the Bureau of Labor Statistics methodology is is inaccurate, right? Or if you want to be a conspiracy person, it's a <laughs> it's an indication of something more nefarious. <laughs> but at any rate, it's definitely an indication that things are worse than they than the headlines first appear. And of course. I've said this before, when, when the job short number comes out, everyone looks at the headline and the first revision gets very little attention and the exactly. second revision gets almost no revision. But both two months, two months were revised downwards this month, hours worked downwards. Um, so, you know, you had, you have a lot of indications. Underemployment is up again. That was the other thing I was going to mention. So unemployment rate moved up a tenth of a percent. But so did what they call underemployment, right. which is people working part time. So a lot of indications that the employment picture, let's put it that way, the employment picture is not as strong as it appears. And I've said this before, you've got an unemployment rate, but if half your people who are, who are employed are only working part time or are working two jobs to make it, you know, to make it to cover expenses yeah, to that's not a sign of a healthy employment picture so the employment picture is a lot worse than it first appears and the second point is that it is slowly deteriorating but again when you had all these handouts particularly at covid handouts to individuals not to have to work handouts to companies but got reimbursed for keeping employees on mm -hmm. well obviously obviously you're going to so you're going to have quants it, you're going to have consequences it's well it's, and it's going to take longer for those consequences to become apparent oh, that's, yeah, that's, yeah, that's yeah. even worse that's even worse <laughs> yeah so so i i think i think the economy is slowing and you know it's very clear from powell as well as some of the other fed members but 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 they really well from powell in particular he really wants to cut rates but he wants to do it when the when economic reports allow him to do it, which they're simply not doing at the moment, right? Um, but 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 I think at some point this year, 
the 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 at some point this year the economic reports will be weak enough that he can justify cutting and remember why he wants to cut or why they have to cut i should say is not because the unemployment rate is ticking up by a tenth of a percent <laughs> as, as he nicely put it shame if you're that tenth of a percent that just got <laughs> laid off but anyway and it's not because the employment the um econ economy is sort of slowing a bit it's certainly not because of a stock market but but they have to be concerned about the federal government budget right. they have to be the interest that the government is federal government is paying on its debt that's why Janet Yellen went to China two weeks ago to beg them to buy <laughs> to buy our treasuries. Interesting. That's why the Fed announced this week why why Jerome Powell announced that they were cutting back on their on their QT on selling off selling down their bonds. Remember, they've been selling them down not by selling them, but just by not rolling them over. Right. They cut that program from sixty billion a month to 25 billion a month this week. Why did they, and and significantly, he said, we're gonna keep the program going on the mortgage-backed securities, but we'll sell fewer, we'll, 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 we'll sell fewer, we'll, we'll roll over more treasuries. Right. We'll be selling fewer treasuries in the market. Why did he do that? Why? Because they're concerned about the frigging treasury market. There's no one, no one wants to buy them at these Nobody rates. wants to buy the, like China's getting begged to buy them. China's, yeah, China's got enough, thank you. They don't want any more. Russia's certainly not buying. Right. And the people that are buying now, are prim the foreign buyers that are buying now are primarily hedge funds that are not looking, that are not looking to buy and hold. That means that that supply will be coming onto the market at some point. And and they are very price sensitive. You know, they're not buying as a reserve asset. Um, you know, you've got a hundred billion dollars to employ. Well, you've got to put it somewhere in treasuries or an <laughs> obvious place to put it. But if you're a hedge fund buying through the Cayman or through Brussels, you buy because you think you can make money on the trade in yeah, the next absolutely. month or two. Yeah. So you want higher rates right now. Absolutely. Well, Adrian, the wealth of knowledge that you give us is is such a huge pleasure. Uh, you coming down to Wall Street Silver, especially our chat today. I think it's it's going to get crazy out there from now to the end of 2024. Yeah. It's going to get crazy. Uh, yeah. Where can people connect with you? Uh, it's uh, The website is www.adrianday.com. Perfect. I'll put the link in the description below so everyone can uh, go straight to your website as well. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. Take care, everyone. Thank you so much, Adrian. Have a good weekend.